My name is Peter Bruninger with AV Showrooms. And I'm here with John Wolf from Classic Audio Loudspeakers. Hi, John. How are you? Good morning, Peter. Welcome to Washington. Thank you very much. John, I've been a fan of JBL loudspeakers my whole life. Growing up as a little boy, the magazines would come in. My dad would read them. I'd pick them up and read them, and I'd see these beautiful loudspeakers called Hartsfields. And you've kept them alive all these years. Could you give me a little history of the loudspeaker? Well, the Hartsfield was developed uh, by a, well, the Hartsfield was developed, first of all, to, to complete a need in the JBL speaker line that Paul Clips started with his Clips horn hmm. in 1947-48. Hmm. Um, Electra Voice was building a corner horn speaker based on the Clips design. Um, Alltech was building uh, corner-shaped speakers, and they were corner-dependent speakers. The Hartsfield uh, with JBL was really the last one to really come on board. Um, and it was quickly uh, claimed to be the best loudspeaker of its day. Uh, many magazine articles were written about it. It ended up in famous Hollywood movie actors' yeah. uh, homes, and uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was built much better than most of the other stuff. Uh, JBL had a unique uh, presence starting out in the uh, early 50s with Hollywood and uh, uh, musical events that were just starting to come alive and really wouldn't hit their peak until the late 60s and early 70s. And the need for powerful loudspeakers were, was just starting to come on. And James Lansing, uh, along with uh, some of his fellow uh, um, engineers that were really involved in the Western Electric theater uh, mm. needs, mm. Um, brought this expertise and experience to the marketplace. And in the development of the Hartsfield cabinet, uh, being a folded horn, quite uniquely different than the Clips folded horn, uh, which he eventually got a, it took him three years to actually be uh, awarded a patent. On, really? On, wow. On the, and it's strictly a cabinet design. Mm -hmm. If it was just another version of a Paul Clips fold, uh, he, he, naturally he wouldn't have been given a, a patent on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what's the reason for the size of the horn and the folded horn? I, I, I know a little bit about why. It's we're trying to get lower frequencies. Uh, this is before the day and age of the sealed box loudspeakers. Can, yeah. can, can, can you imagine yeah. trying to uh, do a movie in a large theater with three, 4,000 people and only having available to you a 8-watt amplifier? <laughs> Horn, horns, <laughs> horns were the... I mean, look back at the Edison, uh, the first Edison Victrola. It had this big horn at the end of the needle That's and, right. and arm. With the it was, dog. It was, it was the most basic, simplest way of amplifying any noise. How about that? John, why is it after 45 years this speaker is still sought after? by collectors, by folks like you that remanufacture it? What's the reason? Well, there's, there's two uh, trains of thought here. Um, number one is the collector wanting the best of what was historically uh, the best. Mm -hmm. uh, paintings, cars, jewelry. There's so many niches of, of uh, collectors that want originality. Mm -hmm for what it was at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's uh, people like me who have realized that with 
a little bit of change this, change that. Uh, you can make this speaker quite applicable and keep up with today's sound qualities. Um, this speaker, um, had it not had a following and had not drawn interest of people that came to my house back in the late 70s and early 80s um, and wanting to have one because they couldn't find anything in their local hi-fi shop stereo store that would give them the sound that they heard at my home mm -hmm. uh, is what drew me into building my first even though I had originals uh, blueprints were readily available mm -hmm. and I had a nice wood shop and loved to pound wood mm -hmm. so I decided that I'd build a few and see see what happened um, so that's that's I think the two genres that have kept this speaker alive among any others uh, eBay uh, audio gone every once in a while Old ones still appear. They've uh, they've uh, gone two, three generations in the United States, but uh, they quickly find themselves a home, uh, usually in Asia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. John, there are a few components from the founding days of quality home audio that have survived the test of time. The best ones have been reintroduced by the original manufacturers. Uh, under new ownership and others by people who had luck to be inspired by them at an early age. Give us some examples. Well, the, the, the two main companies that automatically come to mind are Macintosh mm -hmm. and Marantz. Mm -hmm. uh, Macintosh in uh, the late 80s, uh, after the death of Gordon Gow, who was really Frank Macintosh's emphasis on where that company went mm -hmm. uh, as far as marketing goes mm -hmm. and driving that company to its historic uh, level of quality. Um, they reintroduced the C22 preamplifier mm -hmm. and the uh, 275 uh, power amplifier, stereo mm -hmm. 75 watt per channel amplifier. And I believe that is in its fifth or sixth generation of improvement now, basically on the same chassis and looking almost identical, although you can tell the manufacturer quality between 2000 and 15, 16 is much better than it was in uh, 1959, 60 when yeah. the 275 first uh, came into the marketplace. Yeah, yeah, they even make them in gold finish yeah. for the yeah, for right. certain markets. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, yeah. The uh, the other the other th and they've they've actually now introduced the monoblock. I think they did that a year or two ago, mm -hmm. along with a newer version of the C22 preamplifier. Mm -hmm. Has introduced the monoblock 75 power amplifiers. Mm -hmm. uh, the other company that automatically comes to mind is Marantz, and even though Saul Marantz lost his company uh, in the very late 60s. Uh, Rumor is it was a 10B tuner that put him out of business. Yep. It was costing him $100 more to make that tuner than he could sell it for. Yeah. Yep. Um, that uh, Saul uh, lost the company to Sony Superscope, and uh, it has gone through, I think, two or three more generations of ownership since mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. But, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, they reintroduced the Model 7 uh, to a stereo preamplifier mm -hmm. and the uh, Model 9 monoblock amplifiers and now uh, those are on the collector's market uh, not quite as valuable as the old originals right but they are sought after and I believe they uh, get more money for them than what they sold for when they were reintroduced I think you're right and that was uh, Kevin Hayes from the valve amplification right VAC, company, VAC built company. those they for, built uh, those for, under uh, license, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was. It wasn't any of this when I started. Decided that I was first going to build some Hartz fields for my local market uh, in the, in the early middle '80s. 
I had no idea that 10 years later I would have speakers shipping all over the world. But it just, um, it, 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 it went from just people coming into my basement, as I indicated earlier, then it was local shows, mm -hmm. and then uh, decided that, well, let's take a chance. I'm, in, I'm located in Michigan, mm -hmm. not too far from Chicago, mm -hmm. and uh, in, those, in, the, in the late 80s, and uh, uh, the Chicago uh, Consumer Electronics Show, the weekend after uh, Memorial Day, was the big electronic show for the world. It wasn't just for uh, the United States. At that time, uh, the United States uh, was the leader in electronic innovation and people came from all over the world to that consumer electronic show. Mm -hmm. And there was a dedicated high-end audio wing of that show. Mm -hmm. um, started out at uh, the McCormick Hotel, which was right off the site of the uh, O'Hare, or not, the McCormick Convention Center. And that's where the first so-called high-end wing of the consumer electronic show began. And that building was tore down to expand um, the McCormick Convention Center, and so High End moved down Michigan Avenue to the Hilton, uh, and was at the Hilton for I think four, possibly five years, and that was it. Um, but in 1989, uh, uh, someone talked me into taking my Hartsfields to uh, the Chicago CES show, and. That is where there it's where it all started. That is where I met all of the Asian buyers that were just foaming at the mouth <laughs> to get their hands on originals. <laughs> and I filled I filled that void in, in the marketplace. Um, so I was off and running from that point on. Um, quickly by ninety three, ninety four uh, Chicago had fallen by the wayside and Las Vegas uh, had taken over for the uh, uh, major consumer electronics show. I think Chicago, the main Chicago McCormick complex ran for a few more years mm -hmm. in the summertime, uh, but quickly that, that show died completely and Las Vegas became uh, the premier uh, worldwide electronic show until pretty much 2001, when 9-11 happened, that was the, the real emphasis on, it was much harder to get into the country, and the, China, was, China was emerging as a major market. Mm -hmm. um, not quite sure when the Munich uh, uh, European shows began, mm -hmm. but it was harder to get in the United States. All of the electronics, mass market electronics were now being built overseas. So I believe the the market that was flooded into our shores to find out what we were doing was now spread out over the over a different part of the world and it just it just it, it really ruined what was happening here in the United States. How about that? How about that? Well that's a very interesting observation about the world marketplace. Why did the Hartsfield, though, itself rise above other designs uh, of corner horns? Its design, its use of components uh, for large theater applications, it, it alone was now, it was corner, the speakers were now not corner dependent, but these still stayed alive. Well, as far as the corner dependency goes, this is the, the uniqueness of the Hartsfield, even though it was originally made to fit in a corner because number one it came out when there was mono mm -hmm. and for five, four, five, six years uh, people were very happy to have a single speaker in their house and it wasn't until 59, 60 that stereo really started to come on and people were, were now changing over that had nice mono system they said, well, it's been a time, we should move up and take a stereo. Mm -hmm. And the Hartsfield, some people had the real estate space, 
that they had another corner in their house and they were they were wise enough to buy another Hartsfield. <laughs> That's at the time when you couldn't and, buy one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They, they, yeah. J, J, JBL uh, still uh, sold Hartsfields through 1962, early 63. Um, that's when they officially, and I, I think that the last year to two years, they were really selling stuff that they had built and warehoused. They mm -hmm. really weren't building them anymore. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> once, once that stockpile was used up, uh, they took them out of their catalog, and I believe it was 1962, and that was the end of that. Um, the JBL Paragon, which was that nine and a half foot monster, yeah, that, it's as uh, wide as this that, whole spread that here. sits in the yeah. middle of a room, yeah. was JBL's premier speaker. Yeah, and actually, one of those was a hundred hundred fifty dollars cheaper to buy than if you were to go out and buy two Hartsfields at that particular time, and. And, and they were under a thousand dollars back then. So <laughs> they sell they sell for upwards of fifty thousand dollars in mint condition uh, on the eBay today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, it's yeah, uh, yeah, really uh, yeah. funny how that uh, ends up. But um, the the Hartsfield is a very uniquely different looking loudspeaker. Mm -hmm. uh, some people love it. Some people hate it. I happen mm -hmm. to love it. I do too. Uh, I, 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 I find myself dreaming about it every once in a while <laughs> when, when uh, I have nothing else on my mind. But um, the big thing about the Hartsfield, other than its, than its beauty, was that it took the best components that were being, uh, being used and were just newly coming onto the market that were being developed for uh, uh, live amplification in studios and uh, small, uh, th I don't want to say theaters, but in small venues for live music. Um, they eventually found themselves in multiples into stadiums in the 60s, but that basis of design of, of, the, of the middle 50s JBL under license, really, they were building for uh, Westrex and Ampex. Really, these drivers, the earliest big JBL drivers, actually had Ampex and uh, Westrex labels on it. Gosh. And it wasn't until the Hartsfield that they that they they put a new back cap on the on the 375 mid-range driver and uh, uh, called it the 375. Mm -hmm. And it is really. A permanent magnet version of the Western Electric 555 compression driver. How about that? All of this technology dates back to the 20s. Mm -hmm. uh, materials get better, uh, uh, precision uh, machining gets better, yeah. um, but the basic drive unit of a coil inside of a gap with a piston-driven motor, uh, I, I believe it will be alive as long as speakers are used. How about that? You know, How there's, about that? there's a lot of other designs, mm -hmm. and everybody has their own unique want, want to have a certain sound, but there's nothing like a, a compression driver and a horn-loaded system to give you the feeling that you're at a live event. They're very popular in Europe of yours in Germany. Uh, the Asians collect these. Uh, the German They also audio, listen to yeah, them. Yeah, they, <laughs> they also, also listen to them. I do know that. <laughs> <laughs> and, in, and in some of the smallest homes on the planet too. They, uh, they, should, they, they really show themselves alive in a large venue like we have here, yeah, but yeah. most of them are in very, very small homes being enjoyed quite handily. How about that? Yeah, yeah. That's the amazing part about it is that... Uh, How about that? You know, JBL put all of its resources after time into the pro sound market. The pro sound market, viewers, you know, is when you go to a concert and you see these large arrays that are hanging from the ceiling. 
and you can think back to the early days of rock and roll when there would be just stacks and stacks and stacks of loudspeakers and amplifiers. Um, the audio public that was fickled and until recently if you're at a am amplified music event uh, you were listening to a JBL system so it's fascinating all these years later JBL is still very much dominant uh, in the marketplace. That's correct yeah. and, yeah. and uh, I mean even Harman owns several other companies around the, build around the world mm -hmm. that are building uh, compression drivers and cone speakers um, but as as everybody knows in any other field if if you're in business you go and you want to be a big business you go where the money is and when you can sell literally hundreds of woofers and hundreds of compression drivers and put them in one venue yeah why deal with a stereo store that might sell six of your items a year yeah it just it doesn't make any sense JBL by the time the middle 80s was around, it completely given up on the USA home market. Yep. And yep. actually, another wing of Harman was building their good stuff in nice finished cabinets with modern designs for the Japanese market. And it was really the only place you could find a quality JBL system was after 85, 86, about that. was in Japan. Mm -hmm. And uh, as Asia increased its dominance, found its way first down to Hong Kong, mm -hmm. and then now into mainland China. But these, uh, these are uh, highly sought after now um, over the world, a much bigger portion of the world than they were for quite a long time when just about every one of them was going to only Japan about that well there was a change that did occur though uh, back in the uh, late 60s a man named uh, Ed Vilcher uh, designed a loudspeaker uh, the acoustic research loudspeaker that effectively he redesigned the way the woofer interacted with the cabinet and he was able to shrink the cabinet down and this changed forever the size of loudspeakers in people's homes. So sure did. Yeah, it sure did. So you were now able to, in the late 60s, uh, excuse me, uh, late 50s it was developed, and into the 60s it became to market by an acoustic research loudspeaker, the AR2s and then the AR3s, that were only this big, they were only that wide, it could produce the sound and bass of a speaker this size, so that also helped do a little bit of dealing into the closet. Well, the, the, yeah. biggest, the biggest help for that small speaker was the fact that large amplifiers were now being made. That's until yeah. Yeah. Until like 1958, yeah. if you had a 30-watt amplifier, it was considered a monster amplifier. Uh, the, the 240, I believe, came out uh, in 58 mm -hmm. and the 275 came out in 60 61 the Macintosh the, right right and and uh, but that followed what everybody else was building too. Morantz had their 8 B's at, at 8 and 8 B's and their model 5's at 35 40 watts mm -hmm. per channel and then the model 9 came out about shortly thereafter the Macintosh 275 and it really wasn't until uh, 67, 68, when solid state amplifiers, you could buy a 300 watt solid state amplifier for $300. Mm -hmm. It was a dollar a watt, and that is what really transformed needing a big speaker to fill a reasonable sized room with lifelike music into what now is common day place of very high powered amplifiers in the size space that uh, that a uh, 75 watt tube amplifier was in 1962. That's right, David. So if it wasn't for yeah. if it wasn't yeah. for the solid state yeah. higher powered amplifiers, I remember the first JBL Paragon I went to buy was being replaced uh, in 1970 or 71 
by a pair of Bose 901s yeah. and a Macintosh 2300 solid state amplifier. Mm -hmm. And he thought he was swimming in deep water. It, mm -hmm. it, was, it, was, it was a blessing for me because mm -hmm. um, I still own that speaker and it's a centerpiece in my home. But uh, it, changed, it changed audio history. It did. Uh, forever. It did because it allowed the speakers to get smaller, the amplifiers to become more powerful. Uh, you didn't have tubes to replace. Um, there's not many people making these horn loaded speakers anymore. Uh, I think Klipsch is still making them, I've, are they? I, I, know, I know for a while Klipsch started making his, stopped making the Klipsch horn. Mm -hmm. And it was shortly after Paul's death that they decided they weren't going to anymore. But I believe it was demand in Japan and Asia right. yeah. that brought that back and and into the marketplace. Um, the the um, the problem with the early clips and the early I mean from the for, during from the 40s, uh, Paul was using electro voice components mm -hmm. in his cabinets, which were which were pretty good, and they were actually they were quite good for that particular time. It wasn't until JBL uh, in, uh, in 53 when they developed a voice coil that was four inches in diameter and with the proper magnetic gap in there to, to work that voice coil properly mm -hmm. that, that really changed the, the uh, professional application market. Um, as, as components became better, Paul started putting less expensive aftermarket products. He lost his, his arrangement with Electra Voice. Mm -hmm. Electra Voice was actually building two systems with new cabinetry around his internal folded horn. Mm -hmm. uh, the the uh, patrician mm -hmm. uh, went through a few generations mm -hmm. uh, and with the clips design and in the, in the uh, middle 60s the uh, patrician 700 came out with that 30-inch monster woofer in it, I remember and that, that was yeah. because yep. that was because yep. of the falling of the waves between Paul and his patented horn design mm -hmm. and Electra Voice, mm -hmm. um, and that that just ruined the Patrician because that that 30-inch woofer just it moved a lot of air, but it moved just so slow that everything above it just didn't integrate well. That's right. At all. That's right. It, and, that's and, where and the all. bass sounded separate from everything else. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 But yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, it has to be the fact that the JBL uh, component was the, the the last one designed of what was happening, and it continued to be used in the professional market and stay um, current. I mean, they better machining, uh, better quality diaphragms. Mm -hmm. uh, all of this remained the same well into the uh, late 70s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. John, why are horn-based loudspeakers uh, now so popular again? And uh, they've come back strong into the marketplace. Your order book is always filled. When I go to hi-fi shows throughout the world, there's multitudes of horn-based loudspeakers. Well, what's one of the reasons you think for that? Well, up until the very early 90s, uh, single-ended low-power amplifiers mm -hmm. were really not available in the United States commercially. Uh, the, the, the Asian market kept them alive uh, from from the old Western Electric mm -hmm. and uh, Stromberg Carlson, mm -hmm. and there were various uh, amplifiers that they thought were very good sounding on these older speakers that they were also buying. Mm -hmm. And then a few companies in Japan started building these small, low powered, single ended amplifiers for the commercial market in Japan. And naturally, once they, once they, uh, uh, I don't want to say saturated that market, but found a market for them there. They slowly started to filter them into the United States, first through hobbyists that traveled the world and found yeah. out about them and tried yeah. them. Yeah. And then they, they, they showed up 
in 91, 92 mm -hmm. at a few of the uh, electronic shows and uh, by reputable name companies. Mm -hmm. um, so all of a sudden now there was a need for an efficient loudspeaker again because you were dealing with, in some cases, down two and a half watts. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, 300B amplifier, single-ended 300B amplifier is an eight watt amplifier. And as far as, as, far as I know, the Hertzfield, without a, a uh, uh, amplified, plate amplified subwoofer sitting alongside of it, is the only speaker I know of that will play a rock concert in a normal home <laughs> with, with an 8 watt amplifier. All these other speakers with these big horns sitting on top of them are sitting on top of a plate amplified mm -hmm. subwoofer. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I, my ears have never been able to integrate that subwoofer with what's happening above it. Yeah, uh, viewers, what we're talking about here is how a single ended amplifier in a very efficient folded horn system is able to drive the bass. People today will take horn loaded compression drivers for the mid range and tweeters and then combine them with right, right. with standard driven or now class D modules for the woofers and it, it's it's uh, like a, a oil and water they really don't mix they don't really co uh, are not coherent the horns are lightning fast that's and, right Speed. and, uh, and uh, yeah. there's there's always a, a slowness uh, just it, the, the blending doesn't doesn't happen right that's right it's really ended up to be two schools of audio that we have today uh, or I should say uh, two schools with a sub chapter uh, the two schools, the first school is a very, very high powered solid state amplifier with a very inefficient loudspeaker. Uh, the other school is a more easy to drive loudspeaker with a tube amplifier. And you're getting a little bit more linearity with the tube amplifier. And then the sub school is the magic that we get here with using low powered single ended amplifiers, full range. Right. one amplifier yep. on one speaker. That's it. Yep. Yep. Well, a used JBL Hartsfield is still at the very top of any vintage uh, loudspeaker system in value today. And you're one of the reasons that it's been well, kept alive. Not so much because the, the, the collector that wants an original mm -hmm. uh, is really interested in that original sound also. I see. Uh, I, I believe my, my customer uh, w wants my speaker, number one, for the visual, and, well, number two for the visual, number one for the sound that I've created out of it by the constant improvement over 35 years of different drive units uh, but all off of the basic philosophy of the JBL, mm -hmm. uh, piston-driven mm -hmm. compression driver and woofer. And you've now incorporated field coil uh, low-frequency drivers, and field coil driven drivers are such that it's not a permanent magnet, it's an electromagnet. Correct. And you started to implement that into your loudspeaker well, design. Well, you know, well, yeah, yeah. I, I started to do it for my own sake mm -hmm. uh, because it was it was an experiment in that the other stuff that I was finding, uh, as usual, people were trying to make it cheaper, yep. and and its quality was deteriorating, mm -hmm. and the fact that. I was just not happy with what I was being able to build with other people's off-the-shelf product. Mm -hmm. the, 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 uh, there, was a, there was a company called Cogent that came on the market and, and was re, re, remaking a uh, copy of the uh, uh, RCA compression drivers mm -hmm. that were used for theater purposes. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, were, there were a couple other hobbyists. There was, I can't remember the name name of them, but 
the, the, somebody was toying around with some Alltech drivers and making field coil units out of those. And so the tinkerer in me tinkered. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I, I have a very good friend out in California that uh, maintained all of the major studio uh, speakers for 35 plus years mm -hmm. and uh, uh, with his expertise of what he knew worked and what didn't work uh, we put together some components that I believe are uh, uh, as far as piston driven loudspeakers are the finest in the world. I'd like to add to that we had a reviewer uh, from AV showrooms have a pair not of the Hartsfields but of a different model. Earlier uh, version of the yeah, T. Well, earlier version of the T speakers we have off out of uh, sight. You'll see them in the next uh, front video shot. And I've never heard the female voice reproduced with such realism and accuracy in my life. And to this day, I still remember going over to the reviewer's house on three occasions and coming home and being very disappointed when I turned my system on. <laughs> so it's you've really done a great job with that. I thank you. Want to thank you for that. Thank you. So what's next for classic audio loudspeakers? Um, well, I I uh, I have promised several people that with the uh, introduction of the fifth version of the T1 that I have probably worn myself out. And I just can't imagine what is going to uh, make that speaker sound any better. Um, there you go. The, uh, the tinkerer in me uh, will probably keep tinkering with things, but I, I, uh, I, as usual, change a capacitor brand, change some little thing, and you can sit back and you can say, well, yeah, it sounds different, but is it any better? Doubtful, doubtful. It's it's uh, it's it's reached it's reached a point now. Uh, the field coil just brought everything up to a huge, huge step. That I, frankly, um, you know, what a diamond diaphragm instead of the beryllium. Please, somebody make a beryllium or a diamond diaphragm that I could try, you know, <laughs> maybe, um, God only knows, but uh, we're here and we're uh, going to continue to uh, try and get better, Good. but I think that uh, anybody that buys a classic audio system now is probably going to not be able to say, well, I got to replace it in five or ten years. I owned a pair for ten years. and. Every time I wanted to let the music flow it across me and be part of the feeling of the musical event, is I would hook them up. And I'll never forget that time with your loudspeakers. I Appreciate think you're one that. of the greatest loudspeaker designers today. You've refined the art of the past, get it into the future. Your cabinetry work is beautiful. It's impeccable. It's to die for. So, John, I want to thank you very much for joining us today and thank giving you, us some history on, on these wonderful loudspeakers that viewers, I encourage you to uh, look John up or search these speakers out on the internet. Yeah. There's a lot of articles yeah. about them. We welcome visitors yeah. to Brighton, Michigan all yeah. the time, yeah. or near a major airport. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's uh, several people have come and been thankful that they came because. 20 some years later they're still listening to my speakers how about that so let's do this let's listen to some music we're going to play an ultra analog tape this is one of my favorite tapes it's made by a man named ed pong this is going to be a rendition of beethoven sonata number no. seven uh, for violin and piano john i'd be honored to play them on your system thank you good let's do some listening here we go folks
Thank you. Thank you.